Well, welcome everybody, and thank you for taking the time to be with us on our webinar here today. This webinar is being brought to you by the University of California Distance uh, and Continuing Education, and today we'll be talking about uh, sports uh, predictive analytics. Very fun and interesting topic. I'll give you a little overview of uh, how to predict the Super Bowl and some other things that are coming up. But honestly, uh, a, a skill that can be used in, in a variety of uh, a areas uh, within people's careers. But before we get going, and let me just make sure my – there he goes. I just wanted to introduce uh, myself. I'm Dave Demas out here at UC Irvine. I'm the director of the IT and engineering programs, and we also have on the line Julie Pei, who's a program representative in this area. Just to remind you guys, one of the things that the university does is we, we go out and look for uh, content that is uh, valuable especially valuable to um, students that have graduated and are looking to find, uh, you know, that, that, that right job. So uh, we offer these some short courses and, and, and things that, again, are very uh, high job demand. And, and we believe, we think this is one of them, so we're going to go through this a little bit and give you a little bit of background on, on what it's like and then talk about an upcoming course we have in this area, uh, but we certainly do that for a living. Uh, my apologies are uh, – there he goes. It, it, just a little bit of hesitation on the – I'm not sure why. Well, we are really fortunate, again, to have Dr. Ash Pavel with us. Uh, Ash has been an incredible uh, asset to us here at the university, um, teaching several classes. And uh, we also have advisory board members for several of our programs. And he has uh, been a key member of several advisory board members for us and brought us a lot of new content. And again, one of the things that we do is we're trying to look into the future. Where are the new jobs going to be? And how can we offer some webinars and maybe some courses uh, to help uh, students throughout the United States and honestly even outside of the United States uh, get the content they need to uh, be able to uh, uh, really compete for those jobs. Now, I'm going to let him tell you a little bit more about his background, sure. Ash. Uh, I'm going to move the little pointer over a little closer to you. Okay. I might have to reach in just a tad here. And uh, there you go. So we we're sitting here in the same room, obviously. Okay. So you can tell when we're switching things around, we're not doing a Skype call for this one. Okay. And this is the button to move forward? Yeah. Right okay. There. Right. Great. Okay. So um, hello, everybody. Um, I'm Ash Pawa, and you are looking at uh, my bio, my uh, also my picture right now, and this slide. Uh, so if you want to learn more about me, you can go to my website, ashpawa.com. And I am also on a business called A Plus Web Services, where we provide these kind of uh, services, which is predictive analytics and also web analytics, Google analytics, and so on and on. Uh, my field of expertise is data science, predictive analytics, statistics, R, MATLAB, and web technologies. Uh, before, I worked for General Electric, AT&T, Bell Labs, and Oracle, and I'm also an authorized consultant for Google. Uh, so anyway, this is just my very, very brief background. And today, I will be talking about sports predictive analytics. So that is a very interesting topic, and especially these days because the NFL season is going on, which is National Football League, and some of you may have some interest in that. And my guess is that all the people who are listening right now have an interest in the football, which is very, very hot right now. So just want to tell you in the end of uh, this uh, webinar, I'm going to tell you my predictions oh, okay. about the game. Take a risk on, this, uh, <laughs> on, the, on the game that we played over this weekend. And on the last weekend, which was a wild card game, uh, we made some predictions and we came out to be 100% uh, correct. Uh, so anyway, so that we, I'm going to show you in the end. But now, this is what my outline of my webinar is. First of all, I'm going to define what sports is. <clears throat> and what is the meaning of sports analytics? Uh, so sports analytics is not only predicting who is going to win in the game, but also it does a whole lot of other things as well. The main goal of a sports analytics is not for gamblers just so that you can bet on a game, but try to understand the game and improve the, uh, improve the performance of the players and the team. So that is the primary goal. So we're going to cover those issues. We're also going to cover data sources. Then I'm going to cover sports predictive models. 
So this particular uh, webinar is only focused towards predictive models. Um, but sports um, analytics is a much, a much, much wider area. So we're going to talk about the regression model that we use to do the predictions. We'll talk about multivariable regression with lasso techniques. And then I'm going to give you my NFL prediction model that we have built, and uh, then prediction also for Super Bowl 16. And by the way, last year predictions for the final Super Bowl, uh, we were wrong. We didn't come out right. But hopefully this year we will go. Well, that, that was a different uh, situation, though. That was a, you know. Yes, it was uh, so last year the game was well, they liked that the Broncos won, you yeah. know, but they weren't expected to at all. Right? That's no, right, nobody yeah. was predicting that that. Right, yeah. How'd you do on uh, the presidential election? Oh, well, I was wrong. <laughs> 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 that is always the case. Yeah, I mean, predicted, in fact, nobody could predict, not even a single person predicted no. that Trump is going to win. No. Uh, so, but see, when we do these predictions, we are only uh, indicating the probability. Uh, it means that if that election is going to happen, uh, suppose if, if the odds are that Hillary is going to win 80 percent uh, chance, it means if that election is going to happen 10,000 times, uh, then 80 percent of the time Hillary is going to win. That's what this number basically means. But if you're going to have only a single election, anything can happen. And here, that's what the prediction is. That This basically shows you the probability. So the, if the probability of something is 0.5, if I toss a coin and it says that if a head comes, it does not mean I'm wrong. It's just that what these are the probabilities. That's all. <clears throat> so anyway, let's look into sports. Uh, so, so sports has been an, an inherent part of human culture. Uh, from uh, 776 BC, when the first Greek Olympics were being played, sport has been a part of our culture. So no matter which part of the world you go to, sports has been appreciated and also admired by people. So it doesn't um, mean that uh, we here and only in America sports is being played. No matter which part of the world you go to, everywhere sports always dominates. So the reason why sports, you know, sports has such a clean and good image is because of the sportsman spirit. Most of the people who play real sports, you know, they have these virtues, which is fairness, self-control, courage, and persistence. Uh, and these are the reasons why a good sportsman have always been held in high esteem. Uh, that is the true no matter which country you go to or which time you go to. Uh, since or the, since of the kind of beginning of our civilization, always, uh, you know, sportsmen are always admired. Uh, and so this is basically, the, that's the way we are. It is a, basically a part of our DNA. Uh, that is the reason why sports is so popular. So now these are the most popular sports. As you can see, the soccer is the most dominant one, which is primarily in South America and also Mexico and Africa and Europe especially. They are crazy about soccer. Uh, and then, of course, uh, um, uh, we also have in U.S., uh, we, have, we have, of course, American football. And then cricket is primarily played in India, Pakistan, and also Australia, although the game was basically built in uh, United Kingdom, but um, these countries really dominate those, the, that sport. Then in China, of course, we have table tennis and wrestling. And if you go to Canada, of course, uh, you have ice hockey. So that, these are the primary sports. But otherwise, uh, that with the four main sports in the whole world are, of course, soccer. Uh, soccer uh, and basketball uh, and baseball and football. These are the primary four uh, sports out there. So now let's look into the most popular sports in America. This is the way the things are. In America, we have American football, of course, and we are in the middle of that season. Uh, and then, of course, we have basketball and, uh, and baseball, basketball, auto racing, college football, and golf. As you can see, golf is very, very small compared to football. Football is, is of course, is the main one. There are other, other sports also. But these are the primary sports which are being uh, played here. Now let's try to understand what is sports analytics. Sports analytics just, just does not mean that they're trying to figure it out which team is going to win. Sports analytics is a much wider subject than that. So what are the goals of sports analytics? So first goal is to apply a statistical model to the sporting data. Because sporting data is just a raw data. You cannot make any sense out of it till you apply some statistics to it. The second part is to do the rating and rankings. 
it's very important to find out what the rankings are and we, all the sports uh, tune and, uh, uh, all the sports tournaments are built on what the ratings and rankings are so we need to understand the mathematics behind it the third part is the predictive models. This is the place on which I'm going to focus on today. But sports analytics is much wider than that. And the final part of sports analytics is the player and the team assessment. That is a very important part because most of the uh, sports team uh, have a way by which they can assess uh, you know, uh, the player performance and also the team performance. This is the place where you can build some strategies how to play the game. So the goal of the sports analytics primarily is to improve the performance of the players so that the game can be played between two very good teams because when two very good teams play, uh, then it is good for the fans uh, and it, the, the, the game becomes very enjoyable to watch. And that is the whole idea behind sports analytics. Okay, so now uh, uh, sports generates uh, tons and tons of data. The problem is that most of the decision makers who are, who are the general managers and, and the owners of the team really don't understand the raw data that comes out. So the goal of a data scientist is to not only to understand the sports, the rules of the sports, but to also understand the players and also understand the performance data. Now this raw data has to be fed into statistical models and predictive models. Then you can get some meaningful results which can be conveyed to the decision makers. Otherwise, decision makers cannot understand this raw data because there is so much amount of raw data that it does not make any sense. Uh, so that is our job, <clears throat> me, the job of uh, the data scientists is to understand the statistical models and also the predictive models. So this is the way you can <clears throat> divide all different uh, uh, statistical models and also predictive models. So once you have your raw data, you can share plot a histogram, mean, median, mode, range, variance, standard deviation. Those are some very, very basic stats that you can compute from it. Then you can compute the relationship between uh, two sets of data by using the covariance, correlation. Uh, you can have different kind of a correlation. You can have a Pearson's correlation or Spearman correlation, which is also called the rank correlation. Now, this plays a very important role in, in, in sports, although in the real world, rank, rank correlation is not used that much. Then also we need to understand what is a partial correlation. So anyway, these are the different uh, statistical tests uh, there um, by which you can measure some kind of a metrics of your data. Then you have to test your data. That's basically called inference uh, uh, statistics. You have to understand the normality, how to check your data is normally distributed, outliers, and there are tons of t-tests you can do to, to understand your data. This is called hypothesis testing. So hypothesis get, uh, uh, testing can be done on t-test, ANOVA, which is analysis of variance, and also chi-square. So this is a whole lot of statistics going into it. And using only these statistical tests that we have, uh, we can give some meaning to the data. Otherwise, the owners of the team and also the general managers will not understand the raw data. <clears throat> Once you are done with this, then you have to do the uh, ratings and rankings. So we can do the ELO system or we can do the ranking system. So there are different uh, methods out there. I'm not going to cover these things at least in this webinar, but the course which I'm going to teach is sports analytics. I'm going to cover all of these things in a lot more detail. Then after that, we have to do some predictive models and I'm gonna focus them today. You can do the simple regression, multiple regression, polynomial regression, logistic regression. Then you can also have support vector machine, neural networks. There are a whole lot of models out there that, that, can, be, be, that can be built that allows you to predict what's gonna happen uh, in, in, in a game. And I'm gonna show you one of the models that we have built uh, using multiple linear regression. <clears throat> so there are two types of models that you can build. One is called estimation models, other one is called classification. Uh, so estimation models are regression that estimate a, va a value, whereas the classification models are used very heavily uh, in sports. Um, in fact, uh, as a combination, we, we do these things. So for the classification, we are only classifying whether the probability is more than 0.5 or less than 0.5. Uh, and you can do this thing using logistic regression, 
You, you can do this thing using discriminant analysis, which could be linear or uh, quadratic, or you can also use support vector machines. These are the models that I have used in sports, which basically gives you uh, you know, some good answers. So he, this is the one that will be used to predict finally which team is going to win. So now this is um, a, a method that we use to do the ranking, and, and this ranking is called Arpad Elo. Uh, okay, now Elo was actually a professor at uh, Marguerite uh, uh, University in Milwaukee, and he invented a method to do the ranking of the U.S. chess players. Later on, the, his system has been, has been adopted uh, by the World Chess Federation, and not only in chess, it has also been used uh, in all different sports. So a lot of different sports basically use the ELO system uh, to do the ranking. And this is, and I'm going to show you in the next slide the, what is the mathematics behind it. And that is the formula which is primarily being used. Uh, and again, those of you who have seen that movie, um, uh, The Social Network, uh, which was a very, very popular uh, movie at one time, as you recall that Mark Zuckerberg, while he was at Harvard, he was trying to evaluate the looks of the girls in his dorm. And he used the ELO system to do that thing. In fact, he talks about it in, 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 the, in the movie itself. So this is a way by which you can uh, rank people. And there, of course, Mark Zuckerberg was trying to rank the looks of the girls. But uh, the same system is used, basically. Uh, so here, as you can see, that if two players are going to play with each other, uh, then in that case, if the player A wins, who has a higher ranking, his ranking will come down. So if the player, so before the game, if the player A ratings was RA and the player B ratings were RB, so the difference was RA minus RB. And after the game, the ratings are going to change to RA prime and RB prime. But the total rating will remain the same, the sum which we had before. So whatever A is going to lose, B is going to win. So, and it is based on this formula which is being used. So, this system is what developed by ELO, Alfred ELO, uh, and it is now currently being used in all different sports. Once your ranking is done, then we have to do the rank aggregation. It means that because there are many, many experts out there, uh, they're going to give you a ranking. How to combine all the ranking in one rank? So for that, we use the Borda system, and Borda system is also used for NCAA, and also it is being used for Heisman Trophy and all, all these places where they use the Borda system. And Borda basically was a French mathematician uh, in, in 1770. He was born in 1770, and, um, uh, uh, and uh, so his method is primarily used. Uh, so this is another system that we use primarily to aggregate the ranking. And... Uh, uh, so this, this is the way we basically we do it. Whenever we have ranking, we ask people to do this preferential ballot. Uh, we don't do this sort of a thing in our general elections because in general elections we only choose one person. But if you want, you can have the preferential ballot in which everybody ranks something. And based on that, he has developed the complete mathematics for it uh, by which you can do these things. Now, if, if we would have this kind of a preferential ballot, then uh, we could have asked in our general election that who do you want to select? So if you want Hillary to be number one and Trump to be number two, or the other way around. Uh, so, but we don't do these kind of things because we have only one vote that you can give. But in sports, we use the preferential ballot. And this preferential ballot, how to tally these numbers, uh, it is used in border system, which is used very heavily in sports. So this is a way by which you can aggregate the rankings of the teams. So anyway, this is uh, our, our two methods. Uh, and but our goal uh, here in this webinar is to follow, is to basically um, uh, kind of focus on uh, the predictive models. These are things are called ranking, which I'm not going to get into. But I'm just trying to explore this whole thing with you so that you can understand that a lot of stuff goes into the predictive models. So when we build our predictive models, these rankings are an input to our predictive models before we can predict these things. So what are the goals of sport and, uh, um, for the sport analytics? Now let us look at from the player perspective. So why it has been used? Because we are trying to discover the hidden talents in a new player. This is the place where we're going to use sports analytics. Then we are going to assess the player performance, like which metrics is most important to assess a player performance. And then we are going to put some dollar value to every player. 
and how much of the value of player adds to the team's value. So this thing is very, very important to the general manager uh, of that particular team, uh, that what this new player basically brings about. And not only that, we have the ability you now to measure the performance of that player. Uh, and this thing was shown in the movie Moneyball, in which uh, Bill, uh, uh, Billy Bean uh, was being judged. And at that time, before 2003, uh, this, all the sports an analytics was not a part of the baseball. That is the reason they, they, they used to make uh, some very bad mistakes uh, you know, uh, actually in selecting it. But, but when Billy Bean came about, he introduced the concept of sports analytics uh, to the world of sports. And since after that, the whole game changed after that, and everybody is now using it. So this is the goal of sports, uh, sports analytics, not only to predict who is going to win, but to also uh, to assess the, the, uh, the player performance. Now, once we have the player, then you can go to the team level. So now here you can rank top teams, uh, you can assess the team performance, and which team are the best suited to play against the opposing team. Uh, if you know who your, uh, uh, I mean, who your opponent is going to be, then in that case you can have a different set of uh, players to play against them. What would be that strategy? And that comes from sports analytics. So if a team A is going to play against team B, it may have a different set of members. And if team same team A is going to play with team C, then the members of the team could be slightly different. So Ash, one of the questions that came up was. You know, matchups are really important, right? Especially yes. in things like basketball, you're always switching things out, and and in, and in college football. Yeah. Um, so, so these kinds of techniques allow you to to, to guide which players you want on the field at any particular time. Absolutely, that's, that that's the whole idea. That is the whole idea. It's it's not that trivial. Uh, you have to use a lot of statistics, and you have to evaluate the player and see what are the player's strengths and weaknesses and where the plane, uh, uh, you know, that player is strong. <clears throat> in fact, uh, they have shown in that movie Moneyball that Billy Bean has been selected as a player, but actually he was not a very good player. Uh, if you look at from a statistical point of view, they have shown that in the movie that Billy Bean asked, uh, you, know, uh, you know, his assistant that, uh, you know, who is a real statistician, that would you have hired me? He said, no, you are a lousy player. <laughs> uh, from a statistics point of view, you are a very lousy player. Otherwise, yeah, sure, you can hit a few home runs once in a while. So that is the key. And uh, that basically changed the whole game of sports, that you can evaluate the team, you can evaluate a player, and then you can decide if this player is good enough for me or not. So we need the prediction results. Of course, uh, again, uh, uh, so the goal of the predictive analytics is to do, uh, to evaluate the player and the team so that we can have a good uh, two competitive team. But we can also, uh, I mean, if you do the prediction of a, uh, of a sporting event, uh, in that case, it will gonna also help you in, in, uh, in placing your bets. People, of course, a lot of betting goes on, and if you are playing the fantasy sports in uh, DraftKings or FanDuels, yeah, sure, this thing can also help. But that is not the main goal of it. Many people always think that the goal of a sports predictive analytics is to figure out what the odds are. So the goal of a sports predictive analytics is to improve the player, improve the team, and we understand exactly what these numbers mean. But this is just a side effect of uh, uh, sports analytics. Many people think that this is the main thing, but this is not the main thing. So now let us look into the application of sports analytics. And the primary example, of course, is this movie Moneyball. And this movie came about in 2006. Um, and uh, uh, Brad Pitt is the guy who basically acted out as Billy Bean. And his uh, uh, assistant, uh, which they have shown in the movie, is uh, Peter Brand, which is uh, being played by Jonah Hill. In the real world, uh, I mean, Peter Brand uh, was not his real name, which I'm going to show you in a minute. But anyway, this is the story about uh, how the teams are being selected. And uh, in that particular year, I believe it is 2003, uh, that uh, you know, uh, this uh, uh, Billy Bean used to work for Athletics A team, which is in Oakland. And they were a pretty lousy team. But on that particular year, they reached the playoffs, so which is considered to be a big thing. Uh, so with a very small amount of uh, payroll they had, they were able to select the right players 
for their team and and they had an all time record they won 20 consecutive games in an american league which is an all time record so this thing um, was shown in that particular movie now this is a real billy bean you know the, on the previous slide i showed you only the movie and this is a real billy bean and the guy they have shown in the previous slide his name was uh, 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 peter brand but the real uh, guy's name was paul uh, tipodesta and uh, in fact, uh, they have shown in the movie uh, that Peter Brand went to Yale, but in fact, uh, Paul De Podesta actually went to Harvard. Uh, but that, but this is the real story. In, in the movie, they have changed the story a little bit, but that thing is, of course, allowed. It is just a Hollywood movie. But this is the real stuff. Paul is a guy who changed baseball. He started using statistics uh, to hire people. This is the guy who really uh, changed sports analytics. So this is basically what it is. And this is a Billy Bean. This is Billy Bean is, and Billy Bean hired Paul. So when uh, Billy asked Paul that, uh, would you have hired him? And Paul said, no, you are a lousy player. You, you, you don't deserve it. Uh, but Billy Bean, just because of some other reasons, he was selected by it. Then Billy Bean basically figured it out that, you know, there are certain other things a player should have. Not only the how many number of home runs you're going to hit. Uh, so then he understood the game of uh, baseball. So these are the two guys who basically changed the whole thing. Then after that, we have Bill James, another guy who was hired by Boston Red Sox. Now the Boston Red Sox, as you can see, the world, uh, they, they won the uh, championship in 1918. And then after that, 80 years, they couldn't win, uh, win the World Series. And that was considered to be the curse on Boston Red Sox because in 1918, they traded um, Babe Ruth to Yankees. And so that was considered to be like a curse on Boston Red Sox. They could never win it. But in 2003, Boston Red Sox hired Bill James. And this is the guy who started using statistics. Uh, to improve the game and see they won the World Series in 2004, 2007 and 2013 and this year you know who won the World Series? Cubs uh, and nobody uh, believed that Cubs are ever going to win in the World Series you know but finally they won so again that was a very exciting last game they played so anyway all this thing is happening because of statistics and now of course statistics is being used by everybody so these are the guys basically who changed the whole thing now let's look into some of the literature which is available uh, yeah, uh, um, uh, in the academics about uh, the sports predictive analytics. So there's a book um, uh, from Analytics Method in Sports, Sports Analytics and Data Science, and Sports Performance Measurement and, and Analysis. Now all these three professors who are Thomas Severini and uh, these three guys, uh, uh, Lorena Martin and uh, Thomas Miller, all these three guys are professors of data science at Northwestern. It's very amazing that these three professors who are at Northwestern who have written these three books. Uh, so sports analytics is very uh, well, and all of them have got their PhD from University of Chicago. So University of Chicago is a place where most of the statistics gets done. Then there's another very nice book available, which is called Who is Number One? Uh, this shows about the ranking. They talk about the ELO system, how the ELO system works, and the Broda system. Besides Broda, there are many other ways by which you can you can aggregate the ranks. So this book basically covers those things. So anyway, these are some of the books which are available in literature about sports predictive analytics. Now these are the real books on statistics on do, to do the modeling. Uh, so these two guys are from Stanford. Again, there are two universities which are doing very well uh, the, in statistics. One is University of Chicago, Northwestern, and Stanford. These are the three main universities. Now these guys have written this book. I use this particular book uh, when I teach um, uh, other courses also on statistics here at University of California. So the introduction to statistical learning, this basically talks about how to build the uh, predictive model, regression, multi-regression, and all that stuff. All the predictive analytics comes from these two books primarily. Now, uh, now you, let's talk about the data sources uh, and what kind of a data sources do we have? Uh, because without data, you cannot do any predictive analytics. <clears throat> so uh, your data source should be valid, accurate, complete, and should also contain 
uh, uh, derived variables. Um, uh, so data. Uh, so uh, uh, if your data is wrong, of course your, your your prediction will come out to be wrong. So it's very very important that you should have. So bad data in is bad data out. It means if your uh, if your data is bad, then your prediction will will never come out to be right. So uh, there are many different sources for data. You can go to NFL.com, NBA.com, uh, FootballOutsiders.com, and all these uh, places. Uh, but the data here is not complete. You know, they give you a very, very gross data in the sense that which team won and what is the case. Play. But if you want to have the play-by-play -play, uh, uh, data, there are a few sources you can go to get that data. But you have to pay some money for those things because those people uh, just uh, spend a lot of time in front of the television and keeping track of how the game is being played. Uh, and of course, they sell the data from there as well. So one is called Armchair Analysis. Uh, this is a place where they sell uh, the NFL data. I buy the data from them. Uh, so this is a place where you can get the, get all of that data. Uh, besides that, there are a few other sources also where you can get that data. Ash, can you give us an idea, like, what does it cost? The cost, the cost is very low. It's $49 for the whole year. Oh. Uh, so it, it's, it's, it's not that much. Uh, and uh, so, uh, but some other sources are selling for a little bit more. But then, if you want to have a continuous license, so that every week by week you can get that data um, through uh, some kind of API, you be that we have built, then that costs two hundred dollars. And a few other things are there, but it is not in terms of thousands of dollars. It is something that um, anybody can download the data very easily. Uh, but important thing is that you get so much data from these people, how to make use of the data. That is a place where a lot of uh, effort is required. But getting the raw data is not that difficult these days. A lot of people are collecting the raw data and they are selling it. <clears throat> now let's look into sports predictive models. So as I said before, there are two different types of models. One is called estimation models, another one is called the classification model. Estimation basically gives you a number. Like, uh, you know, and this thing is used to, and, and the main model used for this one is called regression. Uh, and so here you will give you, give you a number. But the classification is something which is used very heavily because this will classify or give you the probability that uh, which team is going to win. And if it is crosses 0.5, it means that the team is going to win. So we use these things. We use uh, this as well, and then we feed the data into our classification model. So we have a combination of these things. So the way we do it is that we have got 300 variables that we take, and we do the regression. Then after that, we do the lasso on top of it so that we can eliminate those variables which are not, not needed. And then, it go, and then we also collect a, a, a lot of uh, uh, ranking. A ranking means that there are a lot of experts out there, uh, and they they basically publish the rankings. Uh, in the USA Today, uh, these things come about, and all different newspapers comes about. They rank all these teams. So we take these rankings and also the estimation that we get, and then we feed into our logistic regression. Our the formula that we have for logistic regression is slightly different ones. Uh, we use to the base of 10 instead of using to the base of E, which has been used in most of the modeling. So we have modified the logistic regression a little bit, so finally we'll get uh, uh, finally, we compute the probability of certain team is going to win or not. So the, these are different models out there. You can have regression, you can have clustering, you can have ARIMA, which is used for time studies, neural network, decision trees, and there are a whole lot of other techniques out there. So yeah, in fact, the, we have built the model using a regression, which is multivariable regression with lasso and a logistic regression. But many other people have built the models using some other technique as well. And everybody predicts uh, answers will be slightly different from each other. Uh, so again, everybody can, can build some other models also uh, based on some other techniques. Now I'm going to talk very briefly about um, uh, our model. We are going to use a regression. Regression, as you know, was basically started by Carl Pearson and Sir, Sir Francis Galton. These are the people who started uh, the concept of regression almost 100 years back. So basically, we use their ideas of regression. In regression, we get a lot of data, and uh, from there, we are trying to find uh, an equation that best fits that particular data. 
So this is a two variable regression, which is y is equal to beta 1x plus c, uh, and you can have uh, also multiple variable regression. So we, we can have y is equal to beta 1x1, beta 2x2, and all the way till beta nxn plus c. So now uh, we use multiple regression. Now, of course, if you have like a five, seven different variables, then you can manage it. But when we do the regression, we have 300 variables. We take a lot of variables, but the question comes up is that, how would you manage such a huge amount of variables? So for that, we use a lasso technique, which I'm gonna talk about in a, in, a, in a few minutes, that allows us to eliminate those variables uh, which are not playing any significant role in the model. And every time you run that model, you're gonna see that the number of variables which have been selected are slightly different from each other. Uh, so that is a technique that we use uh, to select that thing. So now, once you have so many variables, it's very easy to overfit the model. So now, if, you're, if you have tons and tons of data, you're eventually your model will become overfit model. So you can keep on increasing the degree of the polynomial that you're using, eventually your model becomes uh, overfit. So how to solve that problem? We, when you have this overfitting problem, which is too complex, that is the time we use lasso to bring that thing down. This shows that if you, inc if you increase, the if increase the complexity of the model, the error starts coming down and eventually it starts start rising again and again. Uh, and this is the area where your model basically becomes overfit. So this problem is called overfitting model. So we have to prune the tree or we have to bring it back here to the place where you can find the optimum model. And that can be achieved by using lasso techniques. So that's what basically we use. So we try to solve the overfitting problem uh, using uh, the lasso techniques. So the lasso techniques is the place where we find the bias and the variance to be the lowest. So this is the way the error goes as the model complexity increases, as we are increasing the number of variables. So the place where the variance goes up and the bias comes down. So this is what we want. This is the model that we want, and this is we can achieve it uh, using the lasso technique. So that's, this is just kind of a theory of it that you show, shows you, but in the course which I'm going to teach here, we'll cover all these things in a lot more detail. <clears throat> so now suppose if I have a data, if I wanna do a first degree polynomial fit, I can do this. I can increase my to 16th degree uh, polynomial. It'll gonna fit exactly, but this is, becomes an overfit model. Um, so that for the data that I have, it will fit very well. But if a new data comes in, my error will be extremely high in that case. So what is the perfect model? Is it the first degree model or the 16th degree model? So that you can determine uh, by using uh, uh, you know, lasso techniques. So here, as you can see, the number of polynomials we have is one is underfit, two is underfit, uh, four is underfit, eight looks okay, 10 becomes overfit. Now how to find this number? How to find the optimum model? So that takes a lot of a lot of computing time. And to, to and you know every week we have 16 games that have been played. Each game for each game our computer runs for approximately two hours to get to spit out one number. So that is the amount of processing it takes uh, basically to predict the, each, uh, each game. Uh, so there's a lot of work required to build these models. So we use this lasso technique. Lasso stands for least absolute shrinkage and selection operator. That's what lasso basically means. And this lasso technique uh, here that we have, this is the lasso uh, cost factor. So when we do the OLS, which is ordinary least square, our the cost factor is whatever the value that we are predicting minus the actual value, whole square, some of them. But when we do the lasso, we also comp we add a lambda plus the value of the coefficient itself. So this whole area is very mathematical, and we are trying to minimize this whole function, not only this function itself. So in this, as you can see, in a lasso technique, this is same as here, OLS, but we add another, uh, another element to it. Then we vary the value of lambda from zero to infinity and find out which lambda is going to give us you know, the perfect model. So a lot of, lot of processing power it takes to, to find, out the, uh, find out the perfect model uh, and which gives us the least amount of error. So there's a lot of work involved here. So that is just a theory, a theory about how we build a model. Now let's get into the, uh, into the model itself. 
So here is our model. So now I'm going to basically go through uh, how we have built a model. Uh, we have seasons from 2000 to 2015. I'm sorry, actually there's a mistake here. It is 2016 should be the case. Because um, so we collect, so we have got 21 weeks. Week 1 to week 17, we have 16 games for one buy. And week 18 is a wild card game. Then we have divisional payoff. As you know, that last week we had the wild card games. And uh, this week we're going to have the divisional playoff. Then we have a conference championship. And then, of course, week 21 is uh, your Super Bowl. So in this season, we have reached up to this point so far. <clears throat> okay, so this is my data tables that we get from Armchair. We have tons and tons of data. We've got 26 tables. And here, as you can see, we select the variables. Now, which of these variables are going to be significant? That is our trade secret. We, we build our model. We, after doing a lot of experiments, we figure it out that finally, which of these variables are, you know, work usually better. But again, we have not reached perfection. We, okay, we are wrong too many, many times. Uh, but uh, we are, our uh, uh, accuracy rate is around 70%. So 70% of the time we are right, and the time we are wrong as well. Now, besides collecting this data, we also get the data about the stadium data from Wikipedia, city coordinates, and also city GDP. We also have taken into consideration that which team is traveling from which place to which place. Because the further they travel, it reduces the chances of winning. It is called a home court advantage, which has been proven in statistics by many different ways, that the further a team travels, the lower it, it lowers the chances. So we take all these things into consideration. These are different variables that we have uh, to, to, to build our model. Okay, then after that, we also take uh, the ratings. Now, this ratings has been published by Sonny Moore. Uh, and, Sonny, and he's a very uh, famous guy who's, who's always prints out his, his ratings, what he thinks, which team is the number one. Then after that, we also take the uh, rating uh, from uh, Jeff Sagarin. No, no, uh, Jeff Sagarin is a guy who actually publishes in USA Today. In fact, the complete USA Today um, uh, newspaper runs because of this guy. People buy this newspaper just because they want to see what Jeff Sagarin has to say, uh, because he uh, does a lot of predictions in terms of uh, uh, NFL, and he puts out the list that, according to him, which team is number one. So there are a lot of experts out there. So we have our own data. We take the data also from uh, from these experts also who they think that the team is going to win. Uh, so one other thing that we can also add to the model is that we can get the data from Twitter that who uh, the fans, which fans are supporting which team, uh, which we are not doing it right now. And as you can see, Jeff Sagarin is a pretty smart guy. He got his, uh, I don't know, he, he's from MIT, um, but just, he's a pretty smart guy. So he, you know, these very, very smart people, we uh, take uh, their input also into consideration. And then we build our model. So we have built our model, and uh, so this is the package that we use. These are the guys who have built uh, the Glemnet library that we use in R. This is basically Lasso stuff. All the stuff comes from Stanford. Uh, so we use their work, work primarily, and so we use the Glemnet uh, library, and as you can see, this is the cost factor that we use uh, to basically find out what the model is. So there's a lot of mathematics required, so the only purpose of showing you all of these slides is that to, um, uh, to, to let you know that uh, it is not trivial. It's a lot of, lots of uh, math is required uh, to, to build these prediction models. Well, one of the questions that just came up, though, is uh, if, if I'm not a big math, you know, nasty statistician, can I, can I still do some of this? Uh, you cannot build a model unless and until you understand the mathematics. You cannot build a model. But uh, you can um, take some raw data and do some simple statistics, which is going to give you some meaning for to, to, to what you are doing. But to build a model, is a lot of work is required. It's not that simple uh, to create these models. Okay, now let us look into some of the results. So these are the results. So now this is the last year, as you can see that uh, we are comparing uh, uh, our model uh, with um, uh, the Sunny Moore and also Sagarin's model. And uh, our numbers are coming out to be pretty inconsistent with them. And we are, our error rate is coming out to be around 75%. As you can see, this is 0 0.5, 0 0.6, 0 0.7. So if somebody claims that they are 100% right, that is not true. Best you can do in this business is 75%. 
Uh, if you are doing 75, in fact, that is the time to, uh, to uh, kind of celebrate because you are doing very well. 25% uh, of the time, you will turn out to be wrong. Uh, but as long as you are, uh, are above 50%, then you are good, because if you're going to put some money in it, then, then, uh, then um, you have more chance of winning something. You will not lose money if you, if you use these <laughs> models. So yes, these models are not perfect, but uh, they are better than... Uh, in fact, you know, we have some ideas by which th these models can be improved further, uh, but a lot of work is required, and we are working currently on those ideas as well. So this is where the state of the uh, art is. Now, as you can see, again, Sunny Moore and Jeff Sagarin, and we are comparing ourselves with them. This is our, uh, this is Sunny Moore and Jeff Sagarin uh, in terms of the root mean square errors. So we can see that our models are very, very similar to the models that these guys have done. And there are more than 15, 20 models out there in the real world. Uh, ours, is, of course, is one of them. Everybody uses a slightly different techniques to, to, to kind of predict these things. But the model that we have built uh, basically competes with the models that other people have built. Okay, now these are the results for Super Bowl 2016 predictions. Now, in 2016 predictions, as you know, the game was played uh, between Carolina and Denver. Now, this is Nate Silver's prediction. Now, Nate Silver is considered to be also one of the guys uh, who basically does a very accurate prediction. So, uh, he predicted that, uh, that, um, uh, that Carolina is going to win by 59% and uh, Denver is going to win by 41%. But we all know what happened in 2016. And, and this is our model. This is our R code which is running. And we also predicted pretty much the same thing, that Denver versus Carolina, as you can see, Denver was 41, 43%. So that was basically, these are our results uh, from our R code that we have written. Okay, so this is, Nate Silver was saying, Panthers are going to win 59%. We were saying, chances of Panthers winning is 565 and finally, who won? Who won the game? <laughs> we all know who won. Basically, this was the final results that Broncos won by 24-10. So, again, all, in fact, both of us were wrong only for the Super Bowl. But to find out, to, to check whether, to, to see whether uh, uh, we are doing or any model is good or not, you cannot uh, be, it be based on only a single game. Or in a single game, you can be proven wrong. Uh, you have to look into, out of those 300 games that are being played every season, how many of them are correct. And we were correct 70% of the time. So that's basically what is called, uh, what, what basically counts. But our model uh, for 2016 Super Bowl was wrong. But no, wait, now this is the game that was played last weekend. This, is, this was uh, the game that was played last weekend, and we were 100% correct. We, 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 in fact, published these things, uh, you know, on our website and that Green Bay is going to win, uh, Green Bay is going to win, and as you can see, uh, we computed that the probability is 73 percent, and yeah, that this was the actual score, and you can see that the score was 38 to 13, and then Pittsburgh versus, uh, uh, Pittsburgh versus uh, Miami, uh, Dolphins, we predicted that they're going to win, and finally, as you can see, Steelers won by 30-12. Uh, then again was uh, uh, Detroit Lions versus Seattle. We said Seattle is going to win, and as you can see, Seattle won by 26-6. And Houston, uh, Texan, and also um, Raiders, Oakland Raiders, uh, we said that Texans are going to win. So uh, we were right 100% uh, in, in the wild card. Now these are our predictions for the next week. <laughs> now, <laughs> these, so we think that all these four teams that came from wild card are going to lose because they are very, very strong right now. These teams, which uh, I believe Dallas is going to win, they, I, so far we think there's a 63% chance. Uh, and Kansas City is going to win, uh, 59 New England, of course, they are always very strong. I mean, who's going to defeat um, they, they, are, they are. They're just too good. Uh, although they, they kind of cheated two, you know, last, uh, two years back, uh, the deflate gate that occurred to him. But no matter what happens, they are very, very good. And Atlanta is going to win. My guess is that the final Super Bowl will be played between New England and Dallas. 
New England has a slightly better chance, but I'm going to put my money on Dallas this year. <laughs> let's see. Dallas, I've been a very old fan of Dallas, um, you know, so let's see whether Cowboys are going to win or not. So, but anyway, these are our predictions for the, for, for the Super Bowl, which is going to happen, and let's see whether we are correct or not. But this year, our accuracy rate is a little bit less, uh, less than 70%. We are running around 65%, but this is the best we could do at this time. So anyway, so that's what basically we have covered so far. Uh, we have talked about sports, sports analytics, applications of sports analytics, sports analytic literature, data sources, the models, regression models, lasso regression models, and the prediction for 2017 uh, uh, playoffs. Now, let's also introduce you to some of the courses which I will be teaching I, in winter 2017. I'm starting a course on sports predictive analytics. This course is starting on January 30th. Uh, it will It's a seven weeks course, but it will continue till March 19th. So if you have interest in sports predictive analytics, you can register for this course. And, and again, one of the questions that came up is, what kind of background do I need to, to be successful in this class? Do I, do I need to be a mathematician, statistician, or can I, can I get by with uh, a little less? Uh, you, you, of course, you have to have a math background. I mean, that is uh, essential. And you may not how much math? Uh, not too much, but we, because we are going to cover the basic statistics in the class itself. So when we discuss so these things, you, you, yes. you want some like you know algebra and a couple of years of algebra. Right. Doesn't need to be calculus or not much calculus, but at least some of the statistics. So one college level course on, okay, on statistics is required. Okay. Uh, but if you never liked mathematics in your life, and uh, then this is not the course for you. I mean, we have to do mathematics in it. And so, of course, statistics is required. Uh, some basic statistics, of course, is needed. That's what is needed. But you're going to go over some of that in the class, though. That's right? true. You're going to review a lot of that. Okay. That's true. That's true. Okay, so this is what our course is going to be. The course will cover four things. How to apply the statistical model, that what is the T-test, chi-square test, and all different kind of tests which are there for inference uh, to the sporting data. Uh, and uh, then how to do the rating and ranking, which is ELO rating, border rank aggregation. Uh, then we also talk about the predictive models, regression, lasso, logistic regression. And then after that, we're going to cover the player and the team assessment. The other question that just came up was, uh, what tools do you use? Uh, we are going to use R so software uh, and also Excel. Excel and R uh, we are going to use primarily. Okay, I guess that's all, so thank you very much. Uh, and guys, if you have any questions or you're interested in this in these areas or you're look, looking like, you know, uh, you know, thinking that you might want to change uh, the direction of your career, and again, sports analytics is just part of a, of a much broader area that, that uh, Ash mentioned in, in data science and predictive analytics, that, that uh, the job demand is incredibly high. As, as businesses use a lot of these same techniques in order to be more uh, competitive. They've got a lot of data now on their, on their um, customers, right? Whether it's from Twitter feeds or their own customer database or lots and lots of places where they have data and they're, they're looking to utilize that data to be more competitive. You know, very very clear example is, is uh, things like Amazon. At the bottom it says, you might also like this, or on Facebook, you might know this guy. Well, those, those uh, algorithms, which are very similar to the ones that we, we go through in this class, are, are, are very, very important because if they get just a slightly improved number of people that actually buy the things that they suggest, or Netflix, or if you use them, the, the movie that they suggest to you, you make a lot of money because it doesn't cost you anything more. What, what costs you a little bit of time is building out the model, but these kinds of processes, these kinds of thought processes are applicable at so many companies. So you, if, you wanna, if you're interested in this at all and you're thinking about career or job change, you know, go look on Indeed and Monster and, and type in data science or predictive analytics. And, and at the university here, we have several related programs. Uh, this particular class is in one of our certificate programs in predictive analytics. Uh, we also have one in, in big data and in data science, uh, also in Python. Uh, so we have a wide variety of, of courses 
uh, individual courses. That sometimes people just take separate ones. Uh, sometimes people just take an individual class or they decide, hey, I want to get a whole certificate. Uh, again, all of these things are short. The certificates themselves are meant for working adults. For You take five classes uh, over a period of time and, and that is the certificate. It is all very, very practical information that is designed to help people get jobs that uh, employers are looking for. So if you have any questions or we can be of any service at all, we are a nonprofit organization. Uh, we are here to help. Uh, we do charge a little bit for the classes because we got to pay Ash and uh, a few other things. But, uh, we have to feed our kids. Yeah, so we have to feed the kids and everything. But uh, uh, we are here to help. So if you've got any questions, uh, especially come back to the beginning of the slides. And, and one of the questions that also came up was, uh, these, this uh, the video uh, presentation is, was recorded, so you guys will all get a link back to it in case you missed anything or came in late. But right up at the front, you had our contact information. If you've got any questions or you just want some career guidance, uh, regardless of whether you take a class from us or not, we are here to help. So please, and we've got a lot of experience. We talk to people that are in a variety of situations in their careers. We're very well plugged into these industries and uh, we'd be happy to help you move forward in your careers. With that, I'd just like to say thank you again uh, to Ash for, uh, for everything that you've done, not, not much in this, this fun thing. And, and I will go out and bet heavily on this, so on your predictions. <laughs> so in a couple weeks, uh, I may be uh, talking to you and I may be happy. I don't know. We'll see. <laughs> but uh, I also want to thank all of you for hanging out with us for your, a lot of you, I know it was your lunch hour. I appreciate that. Uh, so with that, just have a great afternoon, everybody. Thanks again, Ash. Sure, you're welcome.